Chapter Eleven of the Legends of King Arthur and His Knights by James Knowles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Adventures of Sir Tristram of Lyonesse, Part One. Again, King Arthur held high festival at Caer Leon at Pentecost and gathered round him all the fellowship of the Round Table and so according to his custom sat and waited till some adventure should arise or some knight return to court whose deeds and perils might be told anon he saw sir lancelot and a crowd of knights coming through the doors and leading in their midst the mighty knight sir tristram as soon as king arthur saw him he rose and went through half the hall and held out both his hands and cried right welcome to thee good sir tristram as welcome art thou as any knight that ever came before into this court a long time have i wished for thee amongst my fellowship then all the knights and barons rose up with one accord and came around and cried out welcome queen guinevere came also and many ladies with her and all with one voice said the same then the king took sir tristram by the hand and led him to the round table and said welcome again for one of the best and gentlest knights in all the world a chief in war a chief in peace a chief in field and forest a chief in the ladies chamber right heartily welcome to this court and mayest thou long abide in it when he had so said he looked at every empty seat until he came to what had been sir marhouse's and there he found written in gold letters this is the seat of the noble knight sir tristram whereat they made him with great cheer and gladness a fellow of the round table now the story of sir tristram was as follows there was a king of Lyonesse named meliodas married to the sister of king mark of cornwall a right fair lady and a good and so it happened that King Meliodas, hunting in the woods, was taken by enchantment and made prisoner in a castle. When his wife Elizabeth heard it, she was nigh mad with grief, and ran into the forest to seek out her lord. But after many days of wandering and sorrow she found no trace of him, and laid her down in a deep valley and prayed to meet her death. And so indeed she did. But ere she died, she gave birth in the midst of all her sorrow to a child, a boy, and called him with her latest breath Tristram. For, she said, his name shall show how sadly he hath come into this world. Therewith she gave up her ghost, and the gentlewoman who was with her took the child and wrapped it from the cold as well as she was able, and lay down with it in her arms beneath the shadow of a tree hard by, expecting death to come to her in turn. But shortly after came a company of lords and barons seeking for the queen, and found the lady and the child, and took them home. And on the next day came King Meliodas, whom Merlin had delivered, and when he heard of the queen's death his sorrow was greater than tongue can tell and anon he buried her solemnly and nobly and called the child tristram as she had desired and then for seven years king meliodas mourned and took no comfort and all that time young tristram was well nourished but in a while he wedded with the daughter of howell king of brittany who that her own children might enjoy the kingdom cast about in her mind how she might destroy tristram so on a certain day she put poison in a silver cup where tristram and her children were together playing that when he was athirst he might drink of it and die but so it happened that her own son saw the cup and thinking it must hold good drink he climbed and took it and drank deeply of it and suddenly thereafter burst and fell down dead when the queen heard that her grief was very great but her anger and envy were fiercer than before and soon again she put more poison in the cup and by chance one day her husband finding it when thirsty took it up and was about to drink therefrom 
when seeing him she sprang up with a mighty cry and dashed it from his hands at that king meliodas wondering greatly called to mind the sudden death of his young child and taking her fiercely by the hand he cried traitress tell me what drink is in this cup or i will slay thee in a moment and therewith pulling out his sword he swore by a great oath to slay her if she straightway told him not the truth ah mercy lord said she and fell down at his feet mercy and i will tell thee all and then she told him of her plot to murder tristram that her own sons might enjoy the kingdom the law shall judge thee said the king and so anon she was tried before the barons and condemned to be burnt to death but when the fire was made and she brought out came tristram kneeling at his father's feet and besought of him a favour whatsoever thou desirest i will give thee said the king give me the life then of the queen my stepmother said he thou doest wrong to ask it said meliodas for she would have slain thee with her poisons if she could and chiefly for thy sake she ought to die sir said he as for that i beseech thee of thy mercy to forgive it her and for my part may god pardon her as i do and so i pray thee grant me my boon and for god's sake hold thee to thy promise if it must be so said the king take thou her life for to thee i give it and go do with her as thou wilt then went young tristram to the fire and loosed the queen from all her bonds and delivered her from death and after a great while by his good means the king again forgave and lived in peace with her though never more in the same lodgings anon was tristram sent abroad to france in care of one named governail and there for seven years he learned the language of the land and all knightly exercises and gentle crafts and especially was he foremost in music and hunting and was a harper beyond all others and when at nineteen years of age he came back to his father he was as lusty and strong of body and as noble of heart as ever man was seen now shortly after his return it befell that king anguish of ireland sent to king mark of cornwall for the tribute due to ireland but which was now seven years behindhand to whom king mark sent answer if he would have it he must send and fight for it and they would find a champion to fight against it so king anguish called for sir marhouse his wife's brother a good knight of the round table who lived then at his court and sent him with a knightly retinue in six great ships to cornwall and casting anchor by the castle of tintagel he sent up daily to king mark for the tribute or the champion but no knight there would venture to assail him for his fame was very high in all the realm for strength and hardihood then made king mark a proclamation throughout cornwall that if any knight would fight sir marhaus he should stand at the king's right hand for evermore and have great honour and riches all the rest of his days anon this news came to the land of lyonesse and when young tristram heard it he was angry and ashamed to think no knight of cornwall durst assail the irish champion alas said he that i am not a knight that i might match this marhaus i pray you give me leave sir to depart to king mark's court and beg of his grace to make me knight be ruled by thy own courage said his father so tristram rode away forthwith to tintagel to king mark and went up boldly to him and said sir give me the order of knighthood and i will fight to the uttermost with sir marhaus of ireland what are ye and whence come ye said the king seeing he was but a young man though strong and well made both in body and limb my name is tristram said he and i was born in the country of lyonesse but know ye said the king this irish knight will fight with none who be not come of royal blood and near of kin to kings or queens as he himself is for his sister is the queen of ireland then said tristram 
let him know that i am come both on my father's and my mother's side of blood as good as his for my father is king meliodas and my mother was that queen elizabeth thy sister who died in the forest at my birth when king mark heard that he welcomed him with all his heart and knighted him forthwith and made him ready to go forth as soon as he would choose and armed him royally in armour covered with gold and silver then he sent sir marhaus word that a better man than he should fight with him sir tristram of lyonesse son of king meliodas and of king mark's own sister so the battle was ordained to be fought in an island near sir marhaus's ships and there sir tristram landed on the morrow with governail alone attending him for a squire and him he sent back to the land when he had made himself ready when sir marhaus and sir tristram were thus left alone sir marhaus said young knight sir tristram what doest thou here i am full sorry for thy rashness for oft times have i been assailed in vain and by the best knights of the world be warned in time return to them that sent thee fair knight and well proved knight replied sir tristram be sure that i shall never quit this quarrel till one of us be overcome for this cause have i been made knight and thou shalt know before we part that though as yet unproved i am a king's son and first-born of a queen moreover i have promised to deliver cornwall from this ancient burden or to die also thou shouldst have known sir marhaus that thy valour and thy might are but the better reasons why i should assail thee for whether i win or lose i shall gain honour to have met so great a knight as thou art then they began the battle and tilted at their hardest against each other so that both knights and horses fell to the earth but sir marhaus's spear smote sir tristram a great wound in the side then springing up from their horses they lashed together with their swords like two wild boars and when they had stricken together a great while they left off strokes and lunged at one another's breasts and visors but seeing this availed not they hurtled together again to bear each other down thus fought they more than half the day till both were sorely spent and blood ran from them to the ground on every side but by this time sir tristram remained fresher than sir marhaus and better winded and with a mighty stroke he smote him such a buffet as cut through his helm into his brain-pan and there his sword stuck in so fast that thrice sir tristram pulled ere he could get it from his head then fell sir marhaus down upon his knees and the edge of sir tristram's sword broke off into his brain-pan and suddenly when he seemed dead sir marhaus rose and threw his sword and shield away from him and ran and fled into his ship and tristram cried out after him aha sir knight of the round table dost thou withdraw thee from so young a knight it is a shame to thee and all thy kin i would rather have been hewn into a hundred pieces than have fled from thee but sir marhaus answered nothing and sorely groaning fled away farewell sir knight farewell laughed tristram whose own voice now was hoarse and faint with loss of blood i have thy sword and shield in my safe keeping and will wear them in all places where i ride on my adventures and before king arthur and the table round then was sir marhaus taken back to ireland by his company and as soon as he arrived his wounds were searched and when they searched his head they found therein a piece of tristram's sword but all the skill of surgeons was in vain to move it out so anon sir marhaus died but the queen his sister took the piece of sword blade and put it safely by for she thought that some day it might help her to revenge her brother's death meanwhile sir tristram being sorely wounded sat down softly on a little mound and bled passing fast and in that evil case was found anon by governail and king mark's knights then they gently took him up and brought him in a barge back to the land and lifted him into a bed within the castle 
and had his wounds dressed carefully but for a great while he lay sorely sick and was likely to have died of the first stroke sir marhouse had given him with the spear for the point of it was poisoned and though the wisest surgeons and leeches both men and women came from every part yet could he be by no means cured at last came a wise lady and said plainly that sir tristram never should be healed until he went and stayed in that same country whence the poison came when this was understood the king sent sir tristram in a fair and goodly ship to ireland and by fortune he arrived fast by a castle where the king and queen were and as the ship was being anchored he sat upon his bed and harped a merry lay and made so sweet a music as was never equalled when the king heard the sweet harper was a wounded knight he sent for him and asked his name i am of the country of leoness he answered and my name is tramtrist for he dared not tell his true name lest the vengeance of the queen should fall upon him for her brother's death well said king anguish thou art right welcome here and shalt have all the help this land can give thee but be not anxious if i am at times cast down and sad for but lately in cornwall the best knight in the world fighting for my cause was slain his name was sir marhouse a knight of king arthur's round table and then he told sir tristram all the story of sir marhouse's battle and sir tristram made pretence of great surprise and sorrow though he knew all far better than the king himself then was he put in charge of the king's daughter la belle iso to be healed of his wound and she was as fair and noble a lady as men's eyes might see and so marvellously was she skilled in medicine that in a few days she fully cured him and in return sir tristram taught her the harp so before long they too began to love each other greatly but at that time a heathen knight sir palamedes was in ireland and much cherished by the king and queen he also loved mightily la belle isolt and never wearied of making her great gifts and seeking for her favour and was ready even to be christened for her sake sir tristram therefore hated him out of measure and sir palamedes was full of rage and envy against tristram and so it befell that king anguish proclaimed a great tournament to be held the prize whereof should be a lady called the lady of the lounds of near kindred to the king and her the winner of the tournament should wed in three days afterwards and possess all her lands when la belle isolt told sir tristram of this tournament he said fair lady i am yet a feeble knight and but for thee had been a dead man now what wouldst thou i should do thou knowest well i may not joust ah tristram said she why wilt thou not fight in this tournament sir palamedes will be there and will do his mightiest and therefore be thou there i pray thee or else he will be winner of the prize madam said tristram i will go and for thy sake will do my best but let me go unknown to all men and do thou i pray thee keep my counsel and help me to a disguise so on the day of jousting came sir palamedes with a black shield and overthrew many knights and all the people wondered at his prowess for on the first day he put to the worse sir gawain sir gaheris sir agravaine sir kay and many more from far and near and on the morrow he was conqueror again and overthrew the king with a hundred knights and the king of scotland but presently sir tristram rode up to the lists having been let out at a privy postern of the castle where none could see la belle isolt had dressed him in white armour and given him a white horse and shield and so he came suddenly into the field as it had been a bright angel as soon as sir palamedes saw him he ran at him with a great spear in rest but sir tristram was ready and at the first encounter hurled him to the ground then there arose a great cry that the knight with the black shield was overthrown and palamedes sorely hurt and shamed sought out a secret way 
and would have left the field but tristram watched him and rode after him and bade him stay for he had not yet done with him then did sir palamedes turn with fury and lash at sir tristram with his sword but at the first stroke sir tristram smote him to the earth and cried do now all my commands or take thy death then he yielded to sir tristram's mercy and promised to forsake la belle isolt and for twelve months to wear no arms or armour and rising up he cut his armour off him into shreds with rage and madness and turned and left the field and sir tristram also left the lists and rode back to the castle through the postern gate then was sir tristram long cherished by the king and queen of ireland and ever with la belle isolt but on a certain day while he was bathing came the queen with la belle isolt by chance into his chamber and saw his sword lie naked on the bed anon she drew it from the scabbard and looked at it a long while and both thought it a passing fair sword but within a foot and a half of the end there was a great piece broken out and while the queen was looking at the gap she suddenly remembered the piece of sword-blade that was found in the brain-pan of her brother sir marhaus therewith she turned and cried by my faith this is the felon knight who slew thy uncle and running to her chamber she sought in her casket for the piece of iron from sir marhaus's head and brought it back and fitted it in tristram's sword and surely did it fit therein as closely as it had been but yesterday broke out then the queen caught the sword up fiercely in her hand and ran into the room where sir tristram was yet in his bath and making straight for him had run him through the body had not his squire sir hebes got her in his arms and pulled the sword away from her then ran she to the king and fell upon her knees before him saying lord and husband thou hast here in thy house that felon knight who slew my brother marhaus who is it said the king it is sir tristram said she whom isol hath healed alas replied the king i am full grieved thereat for he is a good knight as ever i have seen in any field but i charge thee leave thou him and let me deal with him then the king went to sir tristram's chamber and found him all armed and ready to mount his horse and said to him sir tristram it is not to prove me against thee i come for it were shameful of thy host to seek thy life depart in peace but tell me first thy name and whether thou slewest my brother sir marhaus then sir tristram told him all the truth and how he had hid his name to be unknown in ireland and when he had ended the king declared that he held him in no blame howbeit i cannot for mine honour's sake retain thee at this court for so i should displease my barons and my wife and all her kin sir said sir tristram i thank thee for the goodness thou hast shown me here and for the great goodness my lady thy daughter hath shown me and it may chance to be more for thy advantage if i live than if i die for wheresoever i may be i shall ever seek thy service and shall be my lady thy daughter's servant in all places and her knight in right and wrong and shall never fail to do for her as much as knight can do then sir tristram went to la belle isolt and took his leave of her o oh, gentle knight said she full of grief am i at your departing for never yet i saw a man to love so well madam said he i promise faithfully that all my life i shall be your knight then sir tristram gave her a ring and she gave him another and after that he left her weeping and lamenting and went among the barons and openly took his leave of them all saying fair lords it so befalleth that i now must depart hence therefore if there be any here whom i have offended or who is grieved with me let him now say it and before i go i will amend it to the utmost of my power and if there be but one who would speak shame of me behind my back let him say it now or never and here is my body to prove it on body against body 
and all stood still and said no word though some there were of the queen's kindred who would have assailed him had they dared so sir tristram departed from ireland and took the sea and came with a fair wind to tintagel and when the news came to king mark that sir tristram was returned healed of his wound he was passing glad and so were all his barons and when he had visited the king his uncle he rode to his father king meliodas and there had all the heartiest welcome that could be made him and both the king and queen gave largely to him of their lands and goods anon he came again to king mark's court and there lived in great joy and pleasure till within a while the king grew jealous of his fame and of the love and favour shown him by all damsels and as long as king mark lived he never after loved sir tristram though there was much fair speech between them then it befell on a certain day that the good knight sir bleobaris de ganis brother to sir blamor de ganis and nigh cousin to sir lancelot of the lake came to king mark's court and asked of him a favour and though the king marvelled seeing he was a man of great renown and a knight of the round table he granted him all his asking then said sir bleobaris i will have the fairest lady in your court at my own choosing i may not say thee nay replied the king choose therefore but take all the issues of thy choice so when he had looked around he chose the wife of earl seguarides and took her by the hand and set her upon horseback behind his squire and rode forth on his way presently thereafter came in the earl and rode out straight away after him in rage but all the ladies cried out shame upon sir tristram that he had not gone and one rebuked him foully and called him coward knight that he would stand and see a lady forced away from his uncle's court but sir tristram answered her fair lady it is not my place to take part in this quarrel while her lord and husband is here to do it had he not been at this court peradventure i had been her champion and if it so befall that he speed ill then may it happen that i speak with that foul knight before he pass out of this realm anon ran in one of sir seguarida's squires and told that his master was sore wounded and at the point of death when sir tristram heard that he was soon armed and on his horse and governail his servant followed him with shield and spear and as he rode he met his cousin sir andret who had been commanded by king mark to bring home to him two knights of king arthur's court who roamed the country thereabouts seeking adventures what tidings said sir tristram god help me never worse replied his cousin for those i went to bring have beaten and defeated me and set my message at naught fair cousin said sir tristram ride ye on your way perchance if i should meet them ye may be revenged so sir andret rode into cornwall but sir tristram rode after the two knights who had misused him namely sir sagramor le desirous and sir dodinas le savage and before long he saw them but a little way before him sir said governail by my advice thou wilt leave them alone for they be two well-proved knights of arthur's court shall i not therefore rather meet them said sir tristram and riding swiftly after them he called to them to stop and asked them whence they came and whither they were going and what they were doing in those marches sir sagramor looked haughtily at sir tristram and made mocking of his words and said fair knight be ye a knight of cornwall wherefore askest thou that said tristram truly because it is full seldom seen replied sir sagramor that cornish knights are valiant with their arms as with their tongues it is but two hours since there met us such a cornish knight who spoke great words with might and prowess but anon with little mastery he was laid on earth as i trow wilt thou be also fair lords said sir tristram it may chance i be a better man than he but be that as it may he was my cousin and for his sake i will assail ye both one cornish knight against ye two 
when sir dodinas le savage heard this speech he caught at his spear and said sir knight keep well thyself and then they parted and came together as it had been thunder and sir dodinas's spear split asunder but sir tristram smote him with so full a stroke as hurled him over his horse's crupper and nearly brake his neck sir sagramor seeing his fellows fall marvelled who this new knight might be and dressed his spear and came against sir tristram as a whirlwind but sir tristram smote him a mighty buffet and rolled him with his horse down on the ground and in the falling he brake his thigh then looking at them both as they lay grovelling on the grass sir tristram said fair knights will ye joust any more are there no bigger knights in king arthur's court will ye soon again speak shame of cornish knight thou hast defeated us in truth replied sir sagramor and on the faith of knighthood i require thee tell us thy right name ye charge me by a great thing said sir tristram and i will answer ye and when they heard his name the two knights were right glad that they had met sir tristram for his deeds were known through all the land and they prayed him to abide in their company nay said he i must find a fellow knight of yours sir bleobaris de ganis whom i seek god speed you well said the two knights and sir tristram rode away soon he saw before him in a valley sir bleobaris with sir seguarid as his wife riding behind his squire upon a palfrey at that he cried aloud abide sir knight of king arthur's court and bring back again that lady or deliver her to me i will not said bleobaris for i dread no cornish knight why said sir tristram may not a cornish knight do well as any other this day but three miles back two knights of thy own court met me and found one cornish knight enough for both before we parted what were their names said sir bleobaris sir sagramor le desirous and sir dodinas le savage said sir tristram ha ah, said sir bleobaris amazed hast thou then met with them by my faith they were two good knights and men of worship and if thou hast beat both thou must needs be a good knight but for all that thou shalt beat me also ere thou hast this lady defend thee then cried out sir tristram and came upon him swiftly with his spear in rest but sir bleobaris was as swift as he and each bore down the other horse and all on to the earth then they sprang clear of their horses and lashed together full eagerly and mightily with their swords tracing and traversing on the right hand and on the left more than two hours and sometimes rushing together with such fury that they both lay grovelling on the ground at last sir bleobaris started back and said now gentle knight hold hard a while and let us speak together say on said sir tristram and i will answer thee sir said sir bleobaris i would know thy name and court and country i have no shame to tell them said sir tristram i am king meliodas's son and my mother was sister to king mark from whose court i now come my name is sir tristram de Lyonnes. truly said sir bleobaris i am right glad to hear it for thou art he that slew sir marhaus hand to hand fighting for the cornish tribute and overcame sir palomides at the great irish tournament where also thou didst overthrow sir gawain and his nine companions i am that knight said sir tristram and now i pray thee tell me thy name i am sir bleobaris de ganis cousin of sir lancelot of the lake one of the best knights in all the world he answered thou sayest truth said sir tristram for sir lancelot as all men know is peerless in courtesy and knighthood and for the great love i bear to his name i will not willingly fight more with thee his kinsman in good faith sir said sir bleobaris i am as loath to fight thee more but since thou hast followed me to win this lady i proffer thee kindness courtesy and gentleness this lady shall be free to go with which of us she pleaseth best i am content said sir tristram for i doubt not she will come to me that shalt thou shortly prove said he 
and called his squire and set the lady in the midst between them who forthwith walked to sir bleoberis and elected to abide with him which when sir tristram saw he was in wondrous anger with her and felt that he could scarce for shame return to king mark's court but sir bleoberis said hearken to me good knight sir tristram because king mark gave me free choice of any gift and because this lady chose to go with me i took her but now i have fulfilled my quest and my adventure and for thy sake she shall be sent back to her husband at the abbey where he lieth so sir tristram rode back to tintagel and sir bleoberis to the abbey where sir seguarides lay wounded and there delivered up his lady and departed as a noble knight after this adventure sir tristram abode still at his uncle's court till in the envy of his heart king mark devised a plan to be rid of him so on a certain day he desired him to depart again for ireland and there demand la belle isolt on his behalf to be his queen for ever had sir tristram praised her beauty and her goodness till king mark desired to wed her for himself moreover he believed his nephew surely would be slain by the queen's kindred if he once were found again in ireland but sir tristram scorning fear made ready to depart and took with him the noblest knights that could be found arrayed in the richest fashion and when they were come to ireland upon a certain day sir tristram gave his uncle's message and king anguish consented thereto but when la belle isolt was told the tidings she was very sorrowful and loath yet made she ready to set forth with sir tristram and took with her dame bragwaine her chief gentlewoman then the queen gave dame bragwaine and governail sir tristram's servant a little flask and charged them that la belle isolt and king mark should both drink of it on their marriage day and then should they surely love each other all of their lives anon sir tristram and isolt with a great company took the sea and departed and so it chanced that one day sitting in their cabin they were athirst and saw a little flask of gold which seemed to hold good wine so sir tristram took it up and said fair lady this looketh to be the best of wines and your maid dame bragwaine and my servant governail have kept it for themselves thereat they both laughed merrily and drank each after other from the flask and never before had they tasted any wine which seemed so good and sweet but by the time they had finished drinking they loved each other so well that their love never more might leave them for weal or woe and thus it came to pass that though sir tristram might never wed la belle isolt he did the mightiest deeds of arms for her sake only all his life then they sailed onward till they came to a castle called pluere where they would have rested but anon there ran forth a great company and took them prisoners and when they were in prison sir tristram asked a knight and lady whom they found therein wherefore they were so shamefully dealt with for said he it was never the custom of any place of honour that i ever came unto to seize a knight and lady asking for shelter and thrust them into prison and a full evil and discourteous custom is it sir said the knight know ye not that this is called the castle pluere or the weeping castle and that it is an ancient custom here that whatsoever knight abideth in it must needs fight the lord of it sir brunor and he that is the weakest shall lose his head and if the lady he hath with him be less fair than the lord's wife she shall lose her head but if she be fairer then must the lady of the castle lose her head now heaven help me said sir tristram but this is a foul and shameful custom yet have i one advantage for my lady is the fairest that doth live in all the world so that i nothing fear for her and as for me i will full gladly fight for my own head in a fair field then said the knight look ye be up betimes to-morrow and make you ready and your lady and on the morrow came sir brunor to sir tristram and put him and isolt forth out of prison 
and brought him a horse and armour, and bade him make ready, for all the commons and estates of that lordship waited in the field to see and judge the battle. Then Sir Brunor, holding his lady by the hand, all muffled, came forth, and Sir Tristram went to meet him, with La Belle Iso beside him, muffled also. Then said Sir Brunor, Sir Knight, if thy lady be fairer than mine, with thy sword smite off my lady's head. But if my lady be fairer than thine, with my sword I will smite off thy lady's head. And if I overcome thee, thy lady shall be mine, and thou shalt lose thy head. Sir Knight, replied Sir Tristram, this is a right foul and felon custom, and rather than my lady shall lose her head, will I lose my own. Nay, said Sir Brunor, but the ladies shall be now compared together, and judgment shall be had. I consent not, cried Sir Tristram, for who is here that will give rightful judgment? Yet doubt not that my lady is far fairer than thine own, and that will I prove and make good. And therewith Sir Tristram lifted up the veil from off La Belle Isol, and stood beside her with his naked sword drawn in his hand. Then Sir Brunor unmuffled his lady, and did in like manner. But when he saw La Belle Isol, he knew that none could be so fair, and all there present gave their judgment so. Then said Sir Tristram, because thou and thy lady have long used this evil custom, and have slain many good knights and ladies, it were a just thing to destroy thee both. In good sooth, said Sir Brunor, thy lady is fairer than mine, and of all women I never saw any so fair. Therefore slay my lady if thou wilt, and I doubt not, but I shall slay thee, and have thine. Thou shalt win her, said Sir Tristram, as dearly as ever knight won lady, and because of thy own judgment and of the evil custom that thy lady hath consented to, I will slay her, as thou sayest. And therewithal Sir Tristram went to him, and took his lady from him, and smote off her head at a stroke. Now take thy horse, cried out Sir Brunor, for since I have lost my lady, I will win thine and have thy life. So they took their horses, and came together as fast as they could fly, and Sir Tristram lightly smote Sir Brunor from his horse. But he rose right quickly, and when Sir Tristram came again, he thrust his horse through both the shoulders, so that it reeled and fell. But Sir Tristram was light and nimble, and voided his horse, and rose up, and dressed his shield before him, though meanwhile, ere he could draw out his sword, Sir Brunor gave him three or four grievous strokes. Then they rushed furiously together like two wild boars, and fought, hurtling and hewing here and there for nigh two hours, and wounded each other full sorely. Then at last Sir Brunor rushed upon Sir Tristram, and took him in his arms to throw him, for he trusted greatly in his strength. But Sir Tristram was at that time called the strongest and biggest knight of the world, for he was bigger than Sir Lancelot, though Sir Lancelot was better breathed. So anon he thrust Sir Brunor grovelling to the earth, and then unlaced his helm, and struck off his head. Then all they that belonged to the castle came, and did him homage and fealty, and prayed him to abide there for a season, and put an end to that foul custom. But within a while he departed, and came to Cornwall, and there King Mark was forthwith wedded to La Belle Isolt with a great joy and splendour. End of Part 1 Recording by Thomas Rose The Adventures of Sir Tristram of Lyonnesse, Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And Sir Tristram had high honour, and ever lodged at the king's court, but for all he had done him such services, King Mark hated him, and on a certain day he set two knights to fall upon him as he rode in the forest. But Sir Tristram lightly smote one's head off, and sorely wounded the other, and made him bear his fellow's body to the king. At that the king dissembled, and hid from Sir Tristram that the knights were sent by him, yet more than ever he hated him in secret, 
and sought to slay him so on a certain day by the assent of sir andret a false knight and forty other knights sir tristram was taken prisoner in his sleep and carried to a chapel on the rocks above the sea to be cast down but as they were about to cast him in suddenly he brake his bonds asunder and rushing at sir andret took his sword and smote him down therewith then leaping down the rocks where none could follow he escaped them but one shot after him and wounded him full sorely with a poisoned arrow in the arm anon his servant governail with sir lambegus sought him and found him safe among the rocks and told him that king mark had banished him and all his followers to avenge sir andret's death so they took ship and came to brittany now sir tristram suffering great anguish from his wound was told to seek isoud the daughter of the king of brittany for she alone could cure such wounds wherefore he went to king howell's court and said lord i am come into this country to have help from thy daughter for men tell me none but she may help me and isoud gladly offering to do her best within a month he was made whole while he abode still at that court an earl named greep made war upon king howell and besieged him and sir kay hedius the king's son went against him but was beaten in battle and sore wounded then the king praying sir tristram for his help he took with him such knights as he could find and on the morrow in another battle did such deeds of arms that all the land spake of him for there he slew the earl with his own hands and more than a hundred knights besides when he came back king howell met him and saluted him with every honour and rejoicing that could be thought of and took him in his arms and said sir tristram all my kingdom will i resign to thee nay answered he god forbid for truly i am beholden to you for ever for your daughter's sake then the king prayed him to take isoud in marriage with a great dower of lands and castles to this sir tristram presently consenting anon they were wedded at the court but within a while sir tristram greatly longed to see cornwall and sir kay hedius desired to go with him so they took ship but as soon as they were at sea the wind blew them upon the coast of north wales nigh to castle perilous hard by a forest wherein were many strange adventures oft times to be met then said sir tristram to sir kay hedius let us prove some of them ere we depart so they took their horses and rode forth when they had ridden a mile or more sir tristram spied a goodly knight before him well armed who sat by a clear fountain with a strong horse near him tied to an oak tree fair sir said he when they came near ye seem to be a knight errant by your arms and harness therefore make ready now to joust with one of us or both thereat the knight spake not but took his shield and buckled it round his neck and leaping on his horse caught a spear from his squire's hand then said sir kay hedius to sir tristram let me assay him do thy best said he so the two knights met and sir kay hedius fell sorely wounded in the breast thou hast well jousted cried sir tristram to the knight now make ready for me i am ready answered he and encountered him and smote him so heavily that he fell down from his horse whereat being ashamed he put his shield before him and drew his sword crying to the strange knight to do likewise then they fought on foot for well nigh two hours till they were both weary at last sir tristram said in all my life i have never met a knight so strong and well breathed as ye be it were a pity we should further hurt each other hold thy hand fair knight and tell me thy name that will i answered he if thou wilt tell me thine my name said he is sir tristram of lyonesse and mine sir lamorac of gaul then both cried out together well met and sir lamorac said sir for your great renown i will that ye have all the worship of this battle and therefore will i yield me unto you and therewith he took his sword by the point to yield him nay said sir tristram 
ye shall not do so, for well I know ye do it of courtesy and not of dread. And therewith he offered his sword to Sir Lamorak, saying, Sir, as an overcome knight, I yield me unto you, as unto the man of noblest powers I have ever met with. Hold, said Sir Lamorak, let us now swear together, never more to fight against each other. Then did they swear, as he said. Then Sir Tristram returned to Sir Kay Hedius, and when he was whole of his wounds, they departed together in a ship, and landed on the coast of Cornwall. And when they came ashore, Sir Tristram eagerly sought news of La Belle Isle, and one told him in mistake that she was dead. Whereat for sore and grievous sorrow he fell down in a swoon, and so lay for three days and nights. When he awoke therefrom, he was crazed, and ran into the forest, and abode there like a wild man many days, whereby he waxed lean and weak of body, and would have died but that a hermit laid some meat beside him as he slept. Now in that forest was a giant named Tauleus, who for fear of Tristram had hid himself within a castle, but when they told him he was mad, came forth and went at large again. And on a certain day he saw a knight of Cornwall, named Sir Dinant, pass by with a lady, and when he had alighted by a well to rest, the giant leaped out from his ambush and took him by the throat to slay him. But Sir Tristram, as he wandered through the forest, came upon them as they struggled, and when the knight cried out for help, he rushed upon the giant, and taking up Sir Dinant's sword, struck off therewith the giant's head, and straightway disappeared among the trees. Anon Sir Dinant took the head of Tauleus, and bare it with him to the court of King Mark, whither he was bound, and told of his adventures. "'Where had ye this adventure?' said King Mark. "'At a fair fountain in thy forest,' answered he. "'I would fain see that wild man,' said the king. So within a day or two he commanded his knights to a great hunting in the forest, and when the king came to the well, he saw a wild man lying there asleep, having a sword beside him, but he knew not it was Sir Tristram. Then he blew his horn, and summoned all his knights to take him gently up, and bear him to the court. And when they came thereto, they bathed and washed him, and brought him somewhat to his right mind. Now La Belle Isolt knew not that Sir Tristram was in Cornwall, but when she heard that a wild man had been found in the forest, she came to see him. And so sorely was he changed, she knew him not. Yet, said she to Dame Bragwain, in good faith I seem to have beheld him oft times before. As she thus spoke, a little hound, which Sir Tristram had given her when she first came to Cornwall, and which was ever with her, saw Sir Tristram lying there, and leaped upon him, licking his hands and face, and whined and barked for joy. Alas! cried out La Belle Isolt, it is my own true knight, Sir Tristram. And at her voice Sir Tristram's senses wholly came again, and well nigh he wept for joy to see his lady living. But never would the hound depart from Tristram, and when King Mark and other knights came up to see him, it sat upon his body and bayed at all who came too near. Then one of the knights said, Surely this is Sir Tristram, I see it by the hound. Nay, said the king, it cannot be, and asked Sir Tristram on his faith who he was. My name, said he, is Sir Tristram of Lyonnes, and now ye may do what ye list with me. Then the king said, It repents me that ye are recovered and sought to make his barons slay him, but most of them would not assent thereto, and counselled him instead to banish Tristram for ten years again from Cornwall, for returning without orders from the king. So he was sworn to depart forthwith. And when he went towards the ship, a knight of King Arthur named Sir Dinadan, who sought him, came and said, Fair knight, ere that you pass out of this country, I pray you joust with me where the good will said he then they ran together and sir tristram lightly smote him from his horse anon he prayed sir tristram's leave to bear him company and when he had consented they rode together to the ship then was sir tristram full of bitterness of heart and said to all the knights who took him to the shore 
Greet well King Mark and all mine enemies from me, and tell them I will come again when I may. Well am I now rewarded for slaying Sir Marhaus and delivering this kingdom from its bondage, and for the perils wherewithal I brought La Belle Isolt from Ireland to the king, and rescued her at the Castle Pluere, and for the slaying of the giant Tauleus, and all the other deeds that I have done for Cornwall and King Mark. Thus angrily and passing bitterly he spake, and went his way. And after sailing a while the ship stayed at a landing-place upon the coast of Wales, and there Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadon alighted, and on the shore they met two knights, Sir Ector and Sir Bors. And Sir Ector encountered with Sir Dinadon, and smote him to the ground, but Sir Bors would not encounter with Sir Tristram, for, said he, no Cornish knights are men of worship. Thereat Sir Tristram was full wroth, for presently there met them two more knights, Sir Bleoberus and Sir Driant, and Sir Bleoberus proffered to joust with Sir Tristram, who shortly smote him down. "'I had not thought,' cried out Sir Bors, "'that any Cornish knight could do so valiantly.' Then Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadon departed, and rode into a forest, and as they rode a damsel met them, who for Sir Lancelot's sake was seeking any noble knights to rescue him, for Queen Morgan le Fay, who hated him, had ordered thirty men-at-arms to lie in ambush for him as he passed, with the intent to kill him. So the damsel prayed them to rescue him. Then said Sir Tristram, Bring me to that place, fair damsel. But Sir Dinadon cried out, It is not possible for us to meet with thirty knights. I will take no part in such a hardihood, for to match one or two or three knights is enough but to match fifteen I will never assay. For shame, replied Sir Tristram, do but your part. That will I not, said he, wherefore I pray ye lend me your shield, for it is of Cornwall, and because men of that country are deemed cowards, ye are but little troubled as ye ride with knights to joust with. Nay, said Sir Tristram, I will never give my shield up for her sake who gave it me. But if thou wilt not stand by me to-day, I will surely slay thee, for I ask no more of thee than to fight one knight, and if thy heart will not serve thee that much, thou shalt stand by and look on me, and them. Would God that I had never met with ye, cried Sir Dinadan, but I promise to look on and do all that I may to save myself. Anon they came to where the thirty knights lay waiting, and Sir Tristram rushed upon them, saying, Here is one who fights for love of Lancelot. Then slew he two of them at the first onset with his spear, and ten more swiftly after with his sword. At that Sir Dinadon took courage and assailed the others with him, till they turned and fled. But Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadon rode on till nightfall, and meeting with a shepherd, asked him if he knew of any lodging thereabouts. "'Truly, fair lords,' said he, "'there is good lodging in a castle hard by. But it is a custom there that none shall lodge therein, save ye first joust with two knights, and as soon as ye be within ye shall find your match.' "'That is an evil lodging,' said Sir Dinadon. "'Lodge where ye will, I will not lodge there.' "'Shame on thee,' said Sir Tristram. "'Art thou a knight at all?' Then he required him on his knighthood to go with him, and they rode together to the castle. As soon as they were near, two knights came out and ran full speed against them, but both of them they overthrew, and went within the castle and had noble cheer. Now when they were unarmed and ready to take rest, there came to the castle gate two knights, Sir Palamedes and Sir Gaheris, and desired the custom of the castle. "'I would far rather rest than fight,' said Sir Dinadan. "'That may not be,' replied Sir Tristram, "'for we must needs defend the custom of the castle, seeing we have overcome its lords. Therefore make ready.' "'Alas, that I ever came into your company,' said Sir Dinadan. So they made ready, and Sir Gaheris encountered Sir Tristram, and fell before him. But Sir Palamedes overthrew Sir Dinadan, and would all fight on foot save Sir Dinadan, for he was sorely bruised and frighted by his fall. And when Sir Tristram prayed him to fight, "'I will not,' answered he, 
for I was wounded by those thirty knights with whom we fought this morning. And as to you, ye are in truth like one gone mad, and who would cast himself away. There be but two knights in the world so mad, and the other is Sir Lancelot, with whom I once rode forth, who kept me evermore at battling, so that for a quarter of a year thereafter I lay in my bed. Heaven defend me again from either of your fellowships. Well, said Sir Tristram, if it must be, I will fight them both. Therewith he drew his sword, and assailed Sir Palamedes and Sir Gaharis together. But Sir Palamedes said, Nay, but it is a shame for two to fight with one. So he bade Sir Gaharis stand by, and he and Sir Tristram fought long together. But in the end Sir Tristram drave him backward, whereat Sir Gaharis and Sir Dinadan with one accord sundered them. Then Sir Tristram prayed the two knights to lodge there, but Sir Dinadan departed and rode away into a priory hard by, and there he lodged that night. And on the morrow came Sir Tristram to the priory to find him, and seeing him so weary that he could not ride, he left him and departed. At that same priory was lodged Sir Pellinore, who asked Sir Dinadan Sir Tristram's name, but could not learn it, for Sir Tristram had charged that he should remain unknown. Then said Sir Pellinore, Since ye will not tell it me, I will ride after him and find it myself. Beware, Sir Knight, said Sir Dinadan, ye will repent it if ye follow him. But Sir Pellinore straightway mounted and overtook him, and cried to him to joust, whereat Sir Tristram forthwith turned and smote him down, and wounded him full sorely in the shoulder. On the day after, Sir Tristram met a herald who told him of a tournament proclaimed between King Carados of Scotland and the King of North Wales to be held at the Maiden's Castle. Now King Carados sought Sir Lancelot to fight there on his side, and the King of North Wales sought Sir Tristram, and Sir Tristram purposed to be there, so as he rode he met Sir Kay the Seneschal and Sir Sagramor and Sir Kay proffered to joust with him, but he refused, desiring to keep himself unwearied for the tourney. Then Sir Kay cried, Sir Knight of Cornwall, joust with me, or yield as recreant. When Sir Tristram heard that, he fiercely turned, and set his spear in rest, and spurred his horse toward him. But when Sir Kay saw him so madly coming on, he in his turn refused whereat Sir Tristram called him coward, till for shame he was compelled to meet him. Then Sir Tristram lightly smote him down, and rode away. But Sir Sagramor pursued him, crying loudly to joust with him also. So Sir Tristram turned, and quickly overthrew him likewise, and departed. Anon a damsel met him as he rode, and told him of a knight adventurous who did great harm thereby, and prayed him for his help. But as he went with her, he met Sir Gawain, who knew the damsel for a maiden of Queen Morgan le Fay, knowing therefore that she needs must have evil plots against Sir Tristram, Sir Gawain demanded of him courteously whither he went. I know not whither, said he, save as this damsel leadeth me. Sir, said Sir Gawain, ye shall not ride with her for she and her lady never yet did good to any and drawing his sword he said to the damsel tell me now straight away for what cause thou leadest this knight or else shalt thou die for i know of old thy lady's treason mercy sir gawain cried the damsel and i will tell thee all then she told him that Queen Morgan had ordained thirty fair damsels to seek out Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram, and by their wiles persuade them to her castle, where she had thirty knights in wait to slay them. "'Oh, shame!' cried Sir Gawain, "'that ever such foul treason should be wrought by a queen and a king's sister!' Then said he to Sir Tristram, Sir knight, if ye will stand with me, we will together prove the malice of these thirty knights. I will not fail you, answered he, for but few days since I had to do with thirty knights of that same queen, and trust we may win honour as lightly now as then. 
So they rode together, and when they came to the castle, Sir Gawain cried aloud, Queen Morgan le Fay, send out thy knights, that we may fight with them. Then the queen urged her knights to issue forth, but they durst not, for they well knew Sir Tristram, and feared him greatly. So Sir Tristram and Sir Gawain went on their way, and as they rode they saw a knight, named Sir Bruse Without Pity, chasing a lady with intent to slay her. Then Sir Gawain prayed Sir Tristram to hold still and let him assail that knight. So he rode up between Sir Bruse and the lady, and cried, False knight, turn thee to me, and leave that lady. Then Sir Bruse turned, and set his spear in rest, and rushed against Sir Gawain, and overthrew him, and rode his horse upon him as he lay, which when Sir Tristram saw, he cried, Forbear that villainy, and galloped at him. But when Sir Bruse saw by the shield it was Sir Tristram, he turned and fled. And though Sir Tristram followed swiftly after him, yet he was so well horsed that he escaped. Anon Sir Tristram and Sir Gawain came nigh the maiden's castle, and there an old knight named Sir Pelones gave them lodging. And Sir Persides, the son of Sir Pelones, a good knight, came out to welcome them. And as they stood talking at a bay window of the castle, they saw a goodly knight ride by on a black horse, carrying a black shield. "'What knight is that?' asked Tristram. "'One of the best knights in all the world,' said Sir Persides. "'Is he Sir Lancelot?' nay answered sir persides it is sir palamedes who is yet unchristened within a while one came and told them that a knight with a black shield had smitten down thirteen knights let us go and see this jousting said sir tristram so they armed themselves and went down and when sir palamedes saw sir persides he sent a squire to him and proffered him to joust so they jousted and sir persides was overthrown then Sir Tristram made ready to joust, but ere he had his spear in rest, Sir Palamedes took him at advantage and struck him on the shield so that he fell. At that Sir Tristram was wroth out of measure and sore ashamed, wherefore he sent a squire and prayed Sir Palamedes to joust once again, but he would not, saying, Tell thy master to revenge himself to morrow at the maiden's castle, where he shall see me again. So on the morrow Sir Tristram, commanded his servant to give him a black shield with no cognizance thereon, and he and Sir Persides rode into the tournament and joined King Carados's side. Then the knights of the King of North Wales came forth, and there was a great fighting and breaking of spears and overthrow of men and horses. Now King Arthur sat above in a high gallery to see the tourney and give the judgment, and Sir Lancelot sat beside him. Then came against Sir Tristram and Sir Persides two knights with them of North Wales, Sir Bleobaris and Sir Gaheris, and Sir Persides was smitten down and nigh slain, for four horsemen rode over him. But Sir Tristram rode against Sir Gaheris and smote him from his horse, and when Sir Bleobaris next encountered him, he overthrew him also. Anon they horsed themselves again, and with them came Sir Dinadan, whom Sir Tristram forthwith smote so sorely that he reeled off his saddle. Then cried he, Ah, Sir Knight, I know ye better than ye deem, and promise never more to come against ye. Then rode Sir Bleobaris at him the second time, and had a buffet that felled him to the earth. And soon thereafter the king commanded to cease for that day and all men marvelled who Sir Tristram was, for the prize of the first day was given him in the name of the Knight of the Black Shield. Now Sir Palamedes was on the side of the King of North Wales, but knew not Sir Tristram again, and when he saw his marvellous deeds he sent to ask his name. As to that, said Sir Tristram, he shall not know at this time, but tell him he shall know, when I have broken two spears upon him, for I am the knight he smote down yesterday, and whatever side he taketh, I will take the other. So when they told him that Sir Palamedes would be on King Carados's side, for he was kindred to King Arthur, then will I be on the King of North Wales's side, said he, but else would I be on my lord King Arthur's. Then on the morrow, 
when king arthur was come the heralds blew unto the tourney and king carados jousted with the king of a hundred knights and fell before him and then came in king arthur's knights and bare back those of north wales but anon sir tristram came to aid them and bear back the battle and fought so mightily that none could stand against him for he smote down on the right and on the left so that all the knights and common people shouted his praise since i bear arms said king arthur never saw i a knight do more marvellous deeds then the king of the hundred knights and those of north wales set upon twenty knights who were of sir lancelot's kin who fought all together none failing the others when sir tristram beheld their nobleness and valour he marvelled much well may he be valiant and full of prowess said he who hath such noble knights for kindred so when he had looked on them a while he thought it shame to see two hundred men assailing twenty and riding to the king of a hundred knights he said i pray thee sir king leave your fighting with those twenty knights for ye be too many and they be too few for ye shall gain no honour if ye win and that i see verily ye will not do unless ye slay them but if ye will not stay i will ride with them and help them nay said the king ye shall not do so for full gladly i will do you courtesy and with that he withdrew his knights then sir tristram rode his way into the forest that no man might know him and king arthur caused the heralds to blow that the tourney should end that day and he gave the king of north wales the prize because sir tristram was on his side and in all the field there was such a cry that the sound thereof was heard two miles away the knight with the black shield hath won the field alas said king arthur where is that knight it is shame to let him thus escape us then he comforted his knights and said be not dismayed my friends howbeit ye have lost the day be of good cheer to-morrow i myself will be in the field and fare with you so they all rested that night and on the morrow the heralds blew unto the field so the king of north wales and the king of a hundred knights encountered with king carados and the king of ireland and overthrew them with that came king arthur and did mighty deeds of arms and overthrew the king of north wales and his fellows and put twenty valiant knights to the worse anon came in sir palamedes and made great fight upon king arthur's side but sir tristram rode furiously against him and sir palamedes was thrown from his horse then cried king arthur knight of the black shield keep thyself and as he spake he came upon him and smote him from his saddle to the ground and so passed on to other knights then sir palamedes having now another horse rushed at sir tristram as he was on foot thinking to run over him but he was aware of him and stepped aside and grasped sir palamedes by the arms and pulled him off his horse then they rushed together with their swords and many stood still to gaze on them and sir tristram smote sir palamedes with three mighty strokes upon the helm crying at each stroke take this for sir tristram's sake and with that sir palamedes fell to the earth anon the king of north wales brought sir tristram another horse and sir palamedes found one also then did they joust again with passing rage for both by now were like mad lions but sir tristram avoided his spear and seized sir palamedes by the neck and pulled him from his saddle and bore him onward ten spears length and so let him fall then king arthur drew forth his sword and smote the spear asunder and gave sir tristram two or three sore strokes ere he could get at his own sword but when he had it in his hand he mightily assailed the king with that eleven knights of lancelot's kin went forth against him but he smote them all down to the earth so that men marvelled at his deeds and the cry was now so great that sir lancelot got a spear in his hand and came down to assay sir tristram saying knight with the black shield make ready when sir tristram heard him he levelled his spear and both stooping their heads they ran together mightily as it had been thunder 
and sir tristram's spear brake short but sir lancelot struck him with a deep wound in the side and broke his spear yet overthrew him not therewith sir tristram smarting at his wound drew forth his sword and rushing at sir lancelot gave him mighty strokes upon the helm so that the sparks flew from it and sir lancelot stooped his head down to the saddle-bow but then sir tristram turned and left the field for he felt his wound so grievous that he deemed he should soon die then did sir lancelot hold the field against all comers and put the king of north wales and his party to the worse and because he was the last knight in the field the prize was given him but he refused to take it and when the cry was raised sir lancelot hath won the day he cried out nay but sir tristram is the victor for he first began and last endured and so hath he done each day and all men honoured lancelot more for his knightly words than if he had taken the prize thus was the tournament ended and king arthur departed to care leon for the whitsun feast was now nigh come and all the knights adventurous went their ways and many sought sir tristram in the forest whither he had gone and at last sir lancelot found him and brought him to king arthur's court as hath been told already End of chapter eleven recording by thomas rose chapter twelve of the legends of king arthur and his knights by james knowles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the quest of the sangrael and the adventures of sir percival sir bors and sir galahad part one the bewitching of merlin the knighting of sir galahad and the commencement of the quest for the sangrael after these things merlin fell into a dotage of love for a damsel of the lady of the lake and would let her have no rest but followed her in every place and ever she encouraged him and made him welcome till she had learned all his crafts that she desired to know then upon a time she went with him beyond the sea to the land of benwick and as they went he showed her many wonders till at length she was afraid and would fain have been delivered from him and as they were in the forest of broceliande they sat together under an oak tree and the damsel prayed to see all that charm whereby men might be shut up yet alive in rocks or trees but he refused her a long time fearing to let her know yet in the end her prayers and kisses overcame him and he told her all then did she make him great cheer but anon as he lay down to sleep she softly rose and walked about him waving her hands and muttering the charm and presently enclosed him fast within the tree whereby he slept and therefrom nevermore he could by any means come out for all the crafts that he could do and so she departed and left merlin at the vigil of the next feast of pentecost when all the knights of the round table were met together at camelot and had heard mass and were about to sit down to meet there rode into the hall a fair lady on horseback who went straight up to king arthur where he sat upon his throne and reverently saluted him god be with thee fair damsel quoth the king what desirest thou of me i pray thee tell me lord she answered where sir lancelot is yonder may ye see him said king arthur then went she to sir lancelot and said sir i salute thee in king pallas's name and require thee to come with me into the forest hereby then asked he her with whom she dwelt and what she wished of him i dwell with king pelles said she whom balin erst so sorely wounded when he smote the dolorous stroke it is he who hath sent me to call thee i will go with thee gladly said sir lancelot and bade his squire straightway saddle his horse and bring his armour then came the queen to him and said sir lancelot will ye leave me thus at this high feast madam replied the damsel 
By dinner time tomorrow he shall be with you. If I thought not, said the queen, he should not go with thee by my good will. Then Sir Lancelot and the lady rode forth till they came to the forest, and in a valley thereof found an abbey of nuns, whereby a squire stood ready to open the gates. When they had entered and descended from their horses, a joyful crowd pressed round Sir Lancelot and heartily saluted him, and led him to the abbess's chamber and unarmed him. Anon he saw his cousins likewise there, Sir Bors and Sir Lionel, who also made great joy at seeing him, and said, By what adventure art thou here? For we thought to have seen thee at Camelot to-morrow. A damsel brought me here, said he, but as yet I know not for what service. As they thus talked, twelve nuns came in, who brought with them a youth so passing fair and well made, that in all the world his match could not be found. His name was Galahad, and though he knew him not, nor Lancelot him, Sir Lancelot was his father. Sir, said the nuns, we bring thee here this child whom we have nourished from his youth, and pray thee to make him a knight, for from no worthier hand can he receive that order. Then Sir Lancelot, looking on the youth, saw that he was seemly and demure as a dove, with every feature good and noble, and thought he never had beheld a better fashioned man of his years. Cometh this desire from himself, said he. Yea, answered Galahad, and all the nuns. Tomorrow, then, in reverence for the feast, he shall have his wish, said Sir Lancelot. And the next day, at the hour of prime, he knighted him, and said, God make of thee as good a man as he hath made thee beautiful. Then with Sir Lionel and Sir Bors he returned to the court, and found all gone to the minister to hear service. When they came into the banquet hall, each knight and baron found his name written in some seat in letters of gold, as, Here ought to sit Sir Lionel, here ought to sit Sir Gawain, and so forth. And in the perilous seat, at the high centre of the table, a name was also written, whereat they marvelled greatly, for no living man had ever yet dared sit upon that seat save one, and him a flame leaped forth and drew down under earth, so that he was no more seen. Then came Sir Lancelot, and read the letters in that seat, and said, My counsel is that this inscription be now covered up until the night be come who shall achieve this great adventure. So they made a veil of silk, and put it over the letters. In the meanwhile came Sir Gawain to the court, and told the king he had a message to him from beyond the sea, from Merlin. For, said he, as I rode through the forest of Broceliande but five days since, I heard the voice of Merlin speaking to me from the midst of an oak tree, whereat in great amazement I besought him to come forth. But he with many groans replied he never more might do so, for that none could free him save the damsel of the lake who had enclosed him there by his own spells which he had taught her. But go, said he, to King Arthur, and tell him that he now prepare his knights and all his table round to seek the sangreal for the time is come when it shall be achieved when sir gawain had spoken thus king arthur sat pensive in spirit and mused deeply of the holy grail and what saintly knight should come who might achieve it anon he bade them hasten to set on the banquet sir said sir kay the seneschal if ye go now to meet, ye will break the ancient custom of your court, for never have ye dined at this high feast till ye have seen some strange adventure. Thou sayest truly, said the king, but my mind was full of wonders and musings till I bethought me not of mine old custom. As they stood speaking thus, a squire ran in and cried, Lord, I bring thee marvellous tidings. What be they? said King Arthur. Lord, said he, 
hereby at the river is a marvellous great stone which i myself saw swim down hitherwards upon the water and in it there is set a sword and ever the stone heaveth and swayeth on the water but floateth down no further with the stream i will go and see it said the king so all the knights went with him and when they came to the river there surely found they a mighty stone of red marble floating on the water as the squire had said and therein stuck a fair and rich sword on the pommel whereof were precious stones wrought skilfully with gold into these words no man shall take me hence but he by whose side i should hang and he shall be the best knight in the world when the king read this he turned round to sir lancelot and said fair sir this sword ought surely to be thine for thou art the best knight in all the world but lancelot answered soberly certainly sir it is not for me nor will i have the hardihood to set my hand upon it for he that toucheth it and faileth to achieve it shall one day be wounded by it mortally but i doubt not lord this day will show the greatest marvels that we have yet seen for now the time is fully come as merlin hath forewarned us when all the prophecies about the sangreel shall be fulfilled then stepped sir gawain forward and pulled at the sword but could not move it and after him sir percival to keep him fellowship in any peril he might suffer but no other knight durst be so hardy as to try now may ye go to your dinner said sir kay for a marvellous adventure ye have had so all returned from the river and every knight sat down in his own place and the high feast and banquet then was sumptuously begun and all the hall was full of laughter and loud talk and jests and running to and fro of squires who served their knights and noise of jollity and mirth then suddenly befell a wondrous thing for all the doors and windows of the hall shut violently of themselves and made thick darkness and presently there came a fair and gentle light from out the perilous seat and filled the palace with its beams then a dead silence fell on all the knights and each man anxiously beheld his neighbour but king arthur rose and said lords and fair knights have ye no fear but rejoice we have seen strange things to-day but stranger yet remain for now i know we shall to-day see him who may sit in the siege perilous and shall achieve the sangreel for as ye all well know that holy vessel wherefrom at the supper of our lord before his death he drank the wine with his disciples hath been held ever since the holiest treasure of the world and wheresoever it hath rested peace and prosperity have rested with it on the land but since the dolorous stroke which balin gave king pelles none have seen it for heaven wroth with that presumptuous blow hath hid it none know where yet somewhere in the world it still may be and may be it is left to us and to this noble order of the table round to find and bring it home and make of this our realm the happiest in the earth many great quests and perilous adventures have ye all taken and achieved but this high quest he only shall attain who hath clean hands and a pure heart and valour and hardihood beyond all other men while the king spoke there came in softly an old man robed all in white leading with him a young knight clad in red from top to toe but without armour or shield and having by his side an empty scabbard the old man went up to the king and said lord here i bring thee this young knight of royal lineage and of the blood of joseph of arimathea by whom the marvels of thy court shall fully be accomplished the king was right glad at his words and said sir ye be right heartily welcome and the young knight also then the old man put on sir galahad for it was he a crimson robe trimmed with fine ermine and took him by the hand and led him to the perilous seat and lifting up the silken cloth which hung upon it read these words written in gold letters 
this is the seat of sir galahad the good knight sir said the old man this place is thine then sat sir galahad down firmly and surely and said to the old man sir ye may now go your way for ye have done well and truly all ye were commanded and commend me to my grandsire king pelles and say that i shall see him soon so the old man departed with a retinue of twenty noble squires but all the knights of the round table marvelled at sir galahad and at his tender age and at his sitting there so surely in the perilous seat then the king led sir galahad forth from the palace to show him the adventure of the floating stone here said he is as great a marvel as i ever saw and right good knights have tried and failed to gain that sword i marvel not thereat said galahad for this adventure is not theirs but mine and for the certainty i had thereof i brought no sword with me as thou mayest see here by this empty scabbard anon he laid his hand upon the sword and lightly drew it from the stone and put it in his sheath and said this sword was that enchanted one which erst belonged to the good knight sir balin wherewith he slew through piteous mistake his brother balan who also slew him at the same time all which great woe befell him through the dolorous stroke he gave my grandsire king pelles the wound whereof is not yet whole nor shall be till i heal him as he stood speaking thus they saw a lady riding swiftly down the river's bank towards them on a white palfrey who saluting the king and queen said lord king nassian the hermit sendeth thee word that to thee shall come to-day the greatest honour and worship that hath yet ever befallen a king of britain for this day shall the sangreal appear in thy house with that the damsel took her leave and departed the same way she came now said the king i know that from to-day the quest of the sangreal shall begin and all ye of the round table will be scattered so that never more shall i see ye again together as ye are now let me then see a joust and tournament amongst ye for the last time before ye go so they all took their harness and met together in the meadows by camelot and the queen and all her ladies sat in a tower to see then sir galahad at the prayer of the king and queen put on a coat of light armour and a helmet but shield he would take none and grasping a lance he drove into the middle of the press of knights and began to break spears marvellously so that all men were full of wonder and in so short a time he had surmounted and exceeded the rest save sir lancelot and sir percival that he took the chief worship of the field then the king and all the court and fellowship of knights went back to the palace and so to evensong in the great minister a royal and goodly company and after that sat down to supper in the hall every night in his own seat as they had been before anon suddenly burst overhead the crackling and crying of great peals of thunder till the palace walls were shaken sorely and they thought to see them riven all to pieces and in the midst of the blast there entered in a sunbeam clearer by seven times than ever they saw day and a marvellous great glory fell upon them all then each knight looking on his neighbour found his face fairer than he had ever seen and so all standing on their feet they gazed as dumb men on each other not knowing what to say then entered into the hall the sangreal borne aloft without hands through the midst of the sunbeam and covered with white samite so that none might see it and all the hall was filled with perfume and incense and every knight was fed with the food he best loved and when the holy vessel had been thus borne through the hall it suddenly departed no man saw whither when they recovered breath to speak king arthur first rose up and yielded thanks to god and to our lord then sir gawain sprang up and said now have we all been fed by miracle with whatsoever food we thought of or desired 
but with our eyes we have not seen the blessed vessel whence it came so carefully and preciously it was concealed therefore i make a vow that from to-morrow i shall labour twelve months and a day in quest of the sangreal and longer if need be nor will i come again into this court until mine eyes have seen it evidently when he had spoken thus night after night rose up and vowed himself to the same quest till the most part of the round table had thus sworn but when king arthur heard them all he could not refrain his eyes from tears and said sir gawain sir gawain thou hast set me in great sorrow for i fear me my true fellowship shall never meet together here again and surely never christian king had such a company of worthy knights around his table at one time and when the queen and her ladies and gentlewomen heard the vows they had such grief and sorrow as no tongue could tell and queen guinevere cried out i marvel that my lord will suffer them to depart from him and many of the ladies who loved knights would have gone with them but were forbidden by the hermit nacian who sent this message to all who had sworn themselves to the quest take with ye no lady or gentlewoman for into so high a service as ye go in no thought but of our lord and heaven may enter on the morrow morning all the knights rose early and when they were fully armed save shields and helms they went in with the king and queen to service in the minister then the king counted all who had taken the adventure on themselves and found them a hundred and fifty knights of the round table and so they all put on their helms and rode away together in the midst of cries and lamentations from the court and from the ladies and from all the town but the queen went alone to her chamber that no man might see her sorrow and sir lancelot followed her to say farewell when she saw him she cried out o oh, sir lancelot thou hast betrayed me thou hast put me to death thus to depart and leave my lord the king ah madam said he be not displeased or angry for i shall come again as soon as i can with honour alas said she that ever i saw thee but he that suffered death upon the cross for all mankind be to thee safety and good conduct and to all thy company then sir lancelot saluted her and the king and went forth with the rest and came with them that night to castle vagon where they abode and on the morrow they departed from each other on their separate ways every night taking the way that pleased him best now sir galahad went forth without a shield and rode so four days without adventure and on the fourth day after evensong he came to an abbey of white monks where he was received in the house and led into a chamber and there he was unarmed and met two knights of the round table king bagdemagus and sir uwain sirs said sir galahad what adventure hath brought ye here within this place as we are told they answered there is a shield no man may bear around his neck without receiving sore mischance or death within three days to-morrow said king bagdemagus i shall attempt the adventure and if i fail do thou sir galahad take it up after me i will willingly said he for as you see i have no shield as yet so on the morrow they arose and heard mass and afterwards king bagdemagus asked where the shield was kept then a monk led him behind the altar where the shield hung as white as any snow and with a blood-red cross in the midst of it sir said the monk this shield should hang from no knight's neck unless he be the worthiest in the world i warn ye therefore knights consider well before ye dare to touch it well said king bagdemagus i know well that i am far from the best knight in all the world yet shall i make the trial and so he took the shield and bore it from the monastery if it please thee said he to sir galahad abide here till thou hearest how i speed i will abide thee said he 
Then, taking with him a squire who might return with any tidings to Sir Galahad, the king rode forth, and before he had gone two miles he saw in a fair valley a hermitage, and a knight who came forth dressed in white armour, horse and all, who rode fast against him. When they encountered, Bagdemagus brake his spear upon the white knight's shield, but was himself struck through the shoulder with a sore wound, and hurled down from his horse. Then the white knight, alighting, came and took the white shield from the king, and said, Thou hast done great folly, for this shield ought never to be borne but by one who hath no living peer. And turning to the squire, he said, Bear thou this shield to the good knight Sir Galahad, and greet him well from me. In whose name shall I greet him? said the squire. Take thou no heed of that, he answered. It is not for thee or any earthly man to know. Now tell me, fair sir, at the least, said the squire, why may this shield be never borne except its wearer come to injury or death? because it shall belong to no man save its rightful owner galahad replied the knight then the squire went to his master and found him wounded nigh to death wherefore he fetched his horse and bore him back with him to the abbey and there they laid him in a bed and looked to his wounds and when he had lain many days grievously sick he at the last barely escaped with his life sir galahad said the squire the knight who overthrew king bagdemagus sent you greeting and bade you bear this shield now blessed be god and fortune said sir galahad and hung the shield about his neck and armed him and rode forth anon he met the white knight by the hermitage and each saluted courteously the other sir said sir galahad this shield i bear hath surely a full marvellous history thou sayest rightly answered he that shield was made in the days of joseph of arimathea the gentle knight who took our lord down from the cross he when he left jerusalem with his kindred came to the country of king evelake who warred continually with one ptolemy and when by the teaching of joseph king evelake became christian this shield was made for him in our lord's name and through its aid king ptolemy was defeated for when king evelake met him next in battle he hid it in a veil and suddenly uncovering it he showed his enemies the figure of a bleeding man nailed to a cross at sight of which they were discomfited and fled presently after that a man whose hand was smitten off touched the cross upon the shield and had his hand restored to him and many other miracles it worked but suddenly the cross that was upon it vanished away. Anon both Joseph and King Evelake came to Britain, and by the preaching of Joseph the people were made Christians. And when at length he lay upon his deathbed, King Evelake begged of him some token ere he died. Then calling for his shield, he dipped his finger in his own blood, for he was bleeding fast, and none could staunch the wound and marked that cross upon it, saying, This cross shall ever show as bright as now, and the last of my lineage shall wear this shield about his neck, and go forth to all the marvellous deeds he will achieve. When the white knight had thus spoken, he vanished suddenly away, and Sir Galahad returned to the abbey. As he alighted came a monk, and prayed him to go see a tomb in the churchyard wherefrom came such a great and hideous noise that none could hear it but they went nigh mad or lost all strength and sir said he i deem it is a fiend lead me thither said sir galahad when they were come near the palace now said the monk go thou to the tomb and lift it up and galahad nothing afraid quickly lifted up the stone and forthwith came out a foul smoke and from the midst thereof leaped up the loathliest figure that ever he had seen in the likeness of a man and galahad blessed himself for he knew it was a fiend of hell then he heard a voice crying out o oh, galahad i cannot tear thee as i would i see so many angels round thee that i may not come at thee 
then the fiend suddenly disappeared with a marvellous great cry and sir galahad looking in the tomb saw there a body all armed with a sword beside it now fair brother said he to the monk let us remove this cursed body which is not fit to lie in a churchyard for when it lived a false and perjured christian man dwelt in it cast it away and there shall come no more hideous noises from the tomb and now must i depart he added for i have much in hand and am upon the holy quest of the sangreal with many more good knights so he took his leave and rode many journeys backwards and forwards as adventures would lead him and at last one day he departed from a castle without first hearing mass which was it ever his custom to hear before he left his lodging anon he found a ruined chapel on a mountain and went in and kneeled before the altar and prayed for wholesome counsel what to do and as he prayed he heard a voice which said depart adventurous knight unto the maiden's castle and redress the violence and wrongs there done hearing these words he cheerfully arose and mounted his horse and rode but half a mile when he saw before him a strong castle with deep ditches round it and a fair river running past and seeing an old churl hard by he asked him what men called that castle fair sir said he it is the maiden's castle it is a cursed place said galahad and all its masters are but felons full of mischief and hardness and shame for that good reason said the old man thou wert well advised to turn thee back for that same reason quoth sir galahad will i the more certainly ride on then looking at his armour carefully to see that nothing failed him he went forward and presently there met him seven damsels who cried out sir knight thou ridest in great peril for thou hast two waters to pass over why should i not pass over them said he and rode straight on anon he met a squire who said sir knight the masters of this castle defy thee and bid thee go no further till thou showest them thy business here fair fellow said sir galahad i am come here to destroy their wicked customs if that be thy purpose answered he thou wilt have much to do go thou said sir galahad and hasten with my message in a few minutes after rode forth furiously from the gateways of the castle seven knights all brothers and crying out knight keep thee bore down all at once upon sir galahad but thrusting forth his spear he smote the foremost to the earth so that his neck was almost broken and warded with his shield the spears of all the others which every one brake off from it and shivered into pieces then he drew out his sword and set upon them hard and fiercely and by his wondrous force drave them before him and chased them to the castle gate and there he slew them at that came out to him an ancient man in priest's vestments saying behold sir here are the keys of this castle then he unlocked the gates and found within a multitude of people who cried out sir knight ye be welcome for long have we waited thy deliverance and told him that the seven felons he had slain had long enslaved the people round about and killed all knights who passed that way because the maiden whom they had robbed of the castle had foretold that by one night they should themselves be overthrown where is the maiden asked sir galahad she lingereth below in a dungeon said they so sir galahad went down and released her and restored her her inheritance and when he had summoned the barons of the country to do her homage he took his leave and departed presently thereafter as he rode he entered a great forest and in a glade thereof met two knights disguised who proffered him to joust these were sir lancelot his father and sir percival but neither knew the other so he and sir lancelot encountered first and sir galahad smote down his father then drawing his sword for his spear was broken he fought with sir percival and struck him so mightily that he clave sir percival's helm and smote him from his horse 
now hard by where they fought there was a hermitage where dwelt a pious woman a recluse who when she heard the sound came forth and seeing sir galahad ride she cried god be with thee the best knight in the world had yonder knights known thee as well as i do they would not have encountered with thee when sir galahad heard that fearing to be made known he forthwith smote his horse with his spurs and departed at a great pace sir lancelot and sir percival heard her words also and rode fast after him but within a while he was out of their sight End of part one. Recording by Thomas Rose.